Oh, wasn't certain that we'd be one and oh, and feeling this way. Hmm. Might as well enjoy it while we can. Keep enjoying, baby. Just play like that every game. Eric Reed is on the Toyota of Hollywood hotline. Crank it up, Solana. Hey! Hey! Toyota of Hollywood Hotline. Shop over 1,500 Toyotas indoors in one of America's largest showrooms at Toyota of Hollywood on 441 between Hollywood and Sheridan. Eric Reed will be on the call tomorrow. Heat, Bucks, Valley Sports Sun. That is the only place to watch it. Blacked out on NBA TV locally here in South Florida. But why would you have watched it there anyway? What are you, some kind of idiot? (laughs) (laughs) I actually tweeted that last night because I love watching Goldie and Moeller on the Mm -hmm. Panthers. And there was a national broadcast as well. And I tweeted out, I said, if you're not watching Goldie and Moeller on Bally Sports Florida, then you're an idiot. I don't think I use those words, but. A little aggressive. A little aggressive on my part. But anyway, uh, tomorrow night, Bally Sports Sun, Eric Reed, John Crotty, the entire crew. It's a 9 p.m. tip off. It's 8 o'clock in Milwaukee, where Eric Reed is now enjoying a little Tuesday in Milwaukee. And he is joining us now. Hello, E. Reed. Hello, gentlemen. Good to be with you guys. Do you agree with me? Anyone who wouldn't be watching you in the first place? I mean, they're idiots. Well, I, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, you know what I think? Uh, when, when, when you get to the playoffs and, and you know, you have a national network covering your, your team, I think there's a natural curiosity for some to want to hear what those broadcasters may have to say. But And, and those guys all do a great job. Listen, I have tremendous respect for everybody uh, at the network level. But there's a difference when you do a team every now and then and when you do a team, you know, 80 games a year. So, um we know we'll have enough folks enjoying the game with us, and, and we're just focused on this series and now the next game. But I'll tell you what, guys, game one had so much in it, so much substance, so much breaking news as it was uh, you had two key players getting injured. And then, you know, what unfolds is one of the greatest offensive games in, in the playoff history of the franchise unfolded and a, and a stunning game one win. Nobody expected game one to go like that. So, Real cool way to start the series, and, and you know, it antes up. The pressure, the drama, the adjustments, and the performances uh, all go up a level with each passing game. Well, what, what do you attribute the shooting to? Because we've been waiting for that shooting performance all season, and we got it at the most opportune time, obviously. Well, well Hawk, I mean, 130 points, 60% from the field and from three. Uh, those are historic numbers for the franchise. Uh, I think it was the eighth best three point percentage in, in playoff history in the NBA. So it was unusual. Um, you know, one of the unusual things about it, by the way, only 25 three point attempts. That's 10 fewer than Miami averages uh, per game uh, during the regular season. But without, listen, first of all, without Giannis for most of the game, they are a different team. Obviously, you know, I, I thought they missed him more defensively than offensively. They still scored 117, but you're not going to win a lot of games when you're giving up 130. And, um, you know, where they're adjust- listen, I don't expect they're going to make a lot of big adjustments. they got to play harder and better. But if you watch the way Brooke Lopez has defended Bam, um, he's, he's five to ten feet off of him. He's giving Bam the shot that Bam has made a living on all year. Bam was second in the league to only Giannis. In, in points in the paint. He, they're giving him that lane, uh, not real close, but from the dotted line to the free throw line, Lopez was giving him that shot um, after a, a not so great first half, just five points. He had 17 in the second half, made eight of his 12 second half shots. So that, that was a key in that game. But listen, the offense, it, it started with Jimmy. You know, usually he lets the game play out before he gets too aggressive for his own points. I think he had 14 in the first quarter. He went right to work. He, he took 17 shots in the first half. And this is not a shoot-first kind of guy. But And now without Tyler Hero, the Heat are going to be even more reliant on the you know getting 30 to 40 points from, from Jimmy Butler. He, he's capable. I, I said it during the last telecast during game one, guys. Um, the way the coaching staff 
played him this year, the way Spo limited his minutes to a manageable 30 to 33 minutes a game, has him right now ready to play 40 to 45 minutes a game. In the play-in win Friday against the Bulls, and in game one Sunday against Milwaukee, 43 minutes. So uh, expect more of that from playoff Jimmy. I don't know if you can duplicate what we saw offensively, but I know both teams are going to play a lot better in game two on the defensive end. And speaking of Tyler's injury, we have differing opinions, you know, on who's going to replace him. Um, you know, I thought it would be Caleb, but Solana made a great point where sometimes Spoh doesn't want to mix up that second group. You know, you know, Hawk got Duncan Robinson started. Duncan every Robinson, he read every team in the league. Oh, he read, but who who is who who has to who has to step in there for Hero? Could you imagine in the middle of this damn series? I got to think about Hoffman <laughs> in, in this whole situation. <laughs> Welcome to my yeah, life. Yeah. And, 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 and Mark, you were on my mind today because obviously that's a huge question. And, and before I answer it, uh, you know, I was I was there at the practice today when Duncan Robinson talked to the uh, when Tyler Hero talked with the media, really honest and upfront um, about the pain he went through. You know, said he put the, the hand in two places going to have surgery on Friday back in Miami. Listen, he's heartbroken. He's not going to be able to play in the biggest games all season. He, he, he prepped himself all year to be ready for this, and he was off to a good start in game one. And it was on a hustle play that he, you know, injures his hand like that. So, you know, he's out four to six weeks, so he would have to go a long way to get him back. But he said something today that really struck home. He said, I felt like I had a point to prove in the playoffs this year. Um, he, you know, and it's a shame he's not going to get a chance to do that. Now, how does Miami overcome that? Um, you know, the team that was last in the league in scoring this year just lost a guy that got him 20 points a game. So it'll be by committee. I don't know firsthand who is going to get the start. I do agree with Solana. We know that Spo likes bringing Kevin Love uh, and Caleb off the bench, even though Martin started 49 games earlier this year. Right now, he's in a real groove coming off the bench. So is Kevin Love. So for me, it comes down to Haywood Highsmith, if you want defense to start the game, or Duncan Robinson, uh, if you want more spacing and, 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 and more three-point shooting, which, which the Heat clearly need. Um, I, if I were to make a guess right now, I think it would be Duncan. That's the way wow. Coach Post started the second half uh, in game one with Duncan. Played about six and a half, third quarter minutes, and that was it. And, and that might be enough. You know, you just never – that's the beauty of the playoffs, guys. You never know what, what twists and turns each game is going to take. So, you know, we saw who the stars of, of game one were. I mean, I think the biggest question going into game two, obviously right now, is, is Giannis's availability. Um, mm -hmm. And if he's available, you know, how healthy is he? How mobile and effective will he be? They're, you know, I think they were 11-8 and eight without him this year. Um, yeah, 11 and 8 without Giannis. They lost twice to Miami without him. They beat Miami late in the season in a game where he only played six minutes against them. Uh, you saw Portis be a much bigger factor. Drew Holiday and Middleton were both, I thought, outstanding for them in game one. But come on, they're not as good without Giannis. I, I, I just saw before we came on with you that he did not take part in their practice today. Um, that's not the greatest sign for them. Uh, they're fortunate that there's two days between games one and two, which will give him time. But, you know, as, as I'm looking at it and thinking about it, guys, to, to force him out of a game, it was it must have been significant enough. And and now a day or two later, he, he missed practice. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see tomorrow night. I'm expecting him and I, I'm, I would guess Coach Spo is expecting him to play, but we'll we'll find out about nine o'clock Eastern tomorrow. Yeah. I'm imagining he's going to play as well. The question would be, is he going to be a hundred percent or is he going to be hobbled a little bit? Well, he's, yeah, listen, he's clearly not going to be a hundred percent, Yeah, but you know, great players have a way of summoning great games, even when they're not at 100%, just his presence on the floor. You know, it was really interesting to me at the beginning of that game guys and Giannis only got 11 minutes, but for most of those minutes, did you notice who he was defending? He started the game on Gabe Vincent. And then when Gabe got two early fouls, Caleb Martin came in, Giannis was on Caleb. And the reason Mike Budenholzer is doing that is to let Giannis sort of roam and be that defensive free safety for them. And, and without him, you know, for most of the game, they gave up 130 points to a team that averaged 109. So 
you know, I'm sure Mike Budenholzer spent most of his uh, prep time in these last 48 hours, you know, figuring out how to how to defend Miami better. You know, talking about what we saw out there, as much as you've watched Jimmy Butler since he's been here, and we know what he can do, does he still continue to impress you? Because you're talking about a guy, I mean, they were talking about it. You guys were talking about it. I mean, it doesn't matter how hard, who he has to guard. That guy's energy level never decreases, it seems. I love him, Hawk. I mean, you know, in, in, in four short years, and three great playoff runs with, with this being the begin. Well, two great playoff runs and a great start to his third. Um, you know, I, I would mention him in the same sentence uh, in greatest playoff performers in Heat history with with a couple of guys named Dwayne and LeBron. And like, you know, he's got. I, I want to give the, the stat correctly. I love this number. I was ready to use it in the last game and didn't get a chance because he didn't get to forty. Dwayne Wade had seven forty-plus point games in 171 playoff games. Butler has six in his first 43 playoff wow. games with the Heat. Think about that. Wow. And he, he has 12 games of 30 points or more. And with Jimmy, scoring is just a part of the package. Um, you know, first of all, I love the old school way that he gets his points in, in a league that's gone, you know, wild over the three-point shot. He's a two-point bucket getter among the best. I mean, to me, him and DeMar DeRozan, and maybe Kawhi Leonard, you know, that's two point getters in the league, but I love the way Jimmy does it, drawing fouls every night. And, you know, for a guy that is so physically, physically dominant in a lot of ways, it is, it's his IQ and his mental approach. He is such a smart basketball player. You seldom see him make a mistake or a bad pass or, or take an ill-advised shot, rarely turns it over, almost never argues with officials plays his butt off on the defensive end and, and really, you know, sets that tone with how competitive he is. And I just, I love the guy because for, for a star player, so unselfish, always looking to get his teammates involved. And, you know, you, you'd see it if Kyle Lowry was healthier, same kind of approach. Um, they do, they do what, what they feel their team needs them to do to win that game. And as simple as that sounds, you wish there were more guys that fit that mold and, and that that was the priority for everybody. It's not. Only the best players um, have, have, have the winning mentality first, foremost, and always. And he really gave me goofbumps hearing how the passion that you have for Jimmy. But I don't know if like the overall, overall basketball world has that same passion. Is, it, is that because he's not flashy? Like, what, is he too old school for the new age game for people to really respect what he does? Bingo. Like, you know what? Right now, it's like if you don't shoot threes, you're looked at as like, you know, an antique car. Like, like you're driving around in Hawks Ford Mustang on Glade <laughs> Road, you know? <laughs> but, you know, I look at the two guys. I already mentioned them. I'm going to mention them again right, right now. DeMar DeRozan and Jimmy Butler I don't think get the admiration or the respect that they deserve because they don't shoot threes. It, it's crazy. I mean, I, listen, I, I hate sound like a, you know, it's old school. I really enjoyed the game when the best shooters took threes. Now everybody takes it. It's the analytics and the math of the game. And, and, you know, I, I had so many coaches as the game was changing, tell me you can't fight the math. Threes are here to stay, but, I'm a, I'm a great believer in the quality of, of shots. And it's, trust me, it is harder in the NBA and in all levels of basketball right now to coach shot selection. I think Steph Curry, is, as much as I love him as a player, uh, in, in some ways I think he changed the game. And I'm not sure for the better because it, it's like quarterbacks trying to you know imitate Mahomes, right? There's only one Mahomes. Everybody else tries throwing his sidearm and across his butt it's not going to look as good. It's, you know, there's a difference when you watch Steph Curry do it and when you watch Trey Young do it. And yet there were times last night where Curry took some shots and, you know, listen, he takes some shots and you think, like, what a bad shot. Often they go in. Yeah. But when they don't, it reverts back to being, you know, not a high quality shot. And, and that's what it's all about, trying to generate the highest quality shots, whether they're from two or three. And it, there's got to be balance. I, I think what helped the Heat so much in game one was the balance. Even though they, they took just 25 threes, 
They made 15 of them. They scored over 60 points in the paint. And here's the other thing they did, guys, that I think is so important. They kept it a half-court game. The Bucks are at their best, and, and a lot of this is Giannis. Nobody scored more fast break points in the league than him. When you could keep them in a half-court game, uh, you got a much better chance at beating them. And all three times Miami has beat Milwaukee this year, twice in the regular season, and on Sunday night, they, they held Milwaukee to under 10 points in transition. They, they held them to six fast break points in game one. Look, look at that stat closely as you watch game two. The lower Milwaukee's fast break points are, uh, the more Miami's chances increase and get better. Eric Reed, he will be on the call tomorrow night. Heat and Bucks, Bally Sports Sun, 9 p.m. tip off from Milwaukee. Can the Heat take a 2 0 lead? We will find out manana. Thank you as always, uh, Eric. Hot Crowder, great, great to be on with you. Looking forward to this series coming back to Miami and uh, hopefully the Heat will be in a great position when it does. And, and thanks for having us on. And hot, I'm going to miss the big FAU party tomorrow at the, at the amphitheater. That's a uh, that's a big get together at Meisner. I mean, I we got to celebrate so our FAU that. Owls. Dusty <laughs> Mays, my neighbor, my hero. I love that program and what a job uh, that team and that coaching staff did this year. Yeah, he's going to be there a long while. Apparently, about a ten year extension. Eric wow. Reed, thanks, Eric. Thanks, guys.